So it's my great pleasure uh, to announce uh, this, uh, to introduce this afternoon's plenary speaker, uh, Alani Wilhelm. Um, she's what I call a triple threat in that she's Native Hawaiian. Um, she's a brilliant uh, scientist, uh, manager, and uh, cultural practitioner, and she comes from a generation that's going to fix all the problems that us old guys set up. <laughs> so Alani now works for Conservation International. Um, she's vice president for Oceans. Uh, she previously was the superintendent of the Papanaumokuakea uh, Marine National Monument, and it's largely because of her work and her foundational efforts um, that things are moving in the direction they're moving. So it's my great pleasure to announce, to introduce Alani Wilhelm. Mahalo, Bob. Aloha ke akua, na akua, na amakua, ame na kupuna, i kaka o mai iau, i ke ala. Aloha ke kanaka, aloha na ho aloha malama aina, aloha no organizing committee of RCIS, or IRC, or ICRS. Um, Velina mai, aloha mai kako, aloha. So, Full confession, I'm not actually a scientist. I'm a student of social science, and I'd say I'm somebody who's worked at the intersection of culture, community, and conservation for more than 20 years. And mostly my work has been in the realm of policy and management, really trying to kind of build alliances and forge pathways to address and to bring more people in to the problems that are facing our natural world and therefore the problems facing us since we are indeed part of that natural world, even if we forget that. Most of my work has been in Hawaii and in the Pacific and also largely focused on the oceans. And I'm extremely humbled and honored to have been asked by Bob to speak. I hear a few other people may have been implicated in that invitation and I I have to admit, I was just ran into Randy Kosaki, a longtime colleague of mine at Popohanaumokuakea, and kind of had a laugh because he knows that like my worst fear is to stand in front of biophysical scientists and try to seem smart. Um, and here you are, like hundreds of you from around the world, and I can feel the great cerebral pulsing in this room. And it's like, what did I do to deserve to, to have to stand in front of people that, I, I'd rather talk to Congress about my budget um, in many ways, because I just have all the, the aloha and respect for the work that you folks do and for the discipline you have to be looking at really what, from a cultural perspective, is really the foundation of the ocean and therefore life on the planet. So thank you for what you do as a start and, and thank you for having me um, speak in this plenary. I will do my very best to be at least mildly entertaining and be worthy of your, of your time. Yeah. I probably should turn on the timer too because I'm Hawaiian and Portuguese and anybody who knows those two genetic predispositions, um, yeah, that's definitely not epigenetic, it's straight, straight up genetic. Um, I have a propensity to talk. So I, my, the, the, the name of the talk is Ocean is Heritage. It's really us thinking about, from my perspective, how you change how people think about the ocean, how think people think about our role in it, is to really understand that it's really about our collective heritage. It's, and it's not about shipwrecks, I mean, deeper heritage. It's about heritage of nature, heritage of people, heritage of the diversity of both life on the planet and human culture. I just returned literally late Sunday night from the Galapagos, you know, the, the kind of epicenter of where Darwin came up with his theory of evolution. Um, and we're sitting around with some uh, colleagues, some of my new colleagues from Conservation International and Jack Kittinger, I don't know where you are, but I know you're here, there you are. He kind of posed the question to us all that, you know, asking us, so what scientific, I'm paraphrasing, what scientific study or perhaps finding or perhaps expedition had the biggest impact on the ocean, right? So we kind of all started throwing out different ideas, right? Is it the defining of species by Aristotle? Or was it William Beebe and the dive bell that helped him found the field of ecology? Or Rachel Carson's 
fabulous books that help make accessible, right, ecology and scientific principles to make regular people be able to understand the, the mystery of the natural world. Or, you know, my vote was Jacques Cousteau, right? And um, whether you thought he was a fabulous scientist or not, man, he opened up the world to most of us, right? Helped us understand and did some crazy things, him and that aqualung, and brought it to TV, right? Again, making oceans now part of our heritage. Or was it Robert Payne and his 1964 recording of humpback songs that changed how we thought about cetaceans and whether or not we should be hunting them? Or Sylvia Earle and her first female, whatever her dive with uh, mission was called, where only women could go because she couldn't go along with the guys before, and it changed the opportunity for women to be in science. Or, I don't know, my other favorite is the transformation of psychology by Dr. Isabella Abbott, likely the first indigenous woman to earn a PhD in natural sciences who really changed our understanding of the role algae plays in ocean ecology and how we really need to give algae a lot more respect. Well, I'm sure when I pose that question via Jack, you folks all have your own ideas and maybe that science is a science you've done or have yet to do in this room. I know we have all of our ideas and I think what really matters is that we're taking, taking all the learnings of this past 100 plus years that in the past 15, at least from my point of view, I've witnessed a real shift towards actionable science, making science that we do actually matter to the real world. And I know that's why the theme of this conference is bridging science to policy, and I'd say it's like bridging science just to like life, right? Bridging science to make it real and actionable to reconnect us back to the core of our heritage if we believe that that's possible. I mean, you guys are all scientists, so how many of you want your science to matter? Just checking. Oh, come on. <laughs> really? All the rest of you, go find other mentors and advisors. <laughs> I don't think you belong in this room. Just joking. Um, why can't I move this? Here we go. And I'd like to dedicate my talk to someone who spent his career trying to bridge this very divide so that his work and the work of his many students and mentees could make a difference. Dr. Paul Joe Keel. I know he's someone that has profoundly impacted many of you in this room. I remember, I don't know how many, more than 10 years ago, I remember hearing him speak about climate change. And although, you know, he's a guy who led the field in like looking at temperature and acidification on corals, he had so much data to share. And he put up a slide and it was a slide of a coconut. And I was like, what is this guy talking about? And he said, to look to the future, of how to solve climate change, we just have to look to the past. There's so much in island cultures, so much knowledge there, that we just need to look back at all of those fundamental understandings and principles to figure out what we need to do in the future. I was stunned, right? He understood, why is it not going? This principle from my culture, right? This idea that knowledge doesn't come from one place. He understood that science was part of knowledge, but it's just one part of knowledge, and there's lots of knowledge out there. And he was a guy who helped bring this olalo no eao, this proverb, to, to me in a real way. And he also, I don't, I don't think I ever actually told him kind of how much he impacted me when he flattered me and asked me to join and co-author a paper with Kule Rogers and a couple other people on, quote, the marine resource management in the Hawaiian archipelago, the traditional Hawaiian system in relation to Western approach. And I asked him, well, why me? I don't know any of that. And he's like, you have your knowledge. It's in you. You've learned it from before. Your perspective matters. And I wish I told him that that is part of what fueled me. Sorry, all these years to bring voice to my people, my culture, the values, the knowledge that even if I don't know it myself, it's in me and it's in my community. You think like, yeah, yeah. And I'd love to say my great grandfather shared that principle with me or my great grandmother brought that to me, but 
like many Hawaiian families, a lot of that tradition honestly was, was broken in my family, and I learned it from Paul Joquiel to be proud of that and to bring that back. So had he been in, this, in the Galapagos with us drinking beers, and I wish he had, I, I'm not sure that he would have asked that question as, as important as that question is, right? What science has mattered to the ocean? I think this is the question he'd ask. Why is this not working? Okay, this is the question he would ask. What knowledge is needed to reverse the decline? It's forward thinking, not just what has already impacted us, but what knowledge, science and others, that we really need to, for the future. So with this, please allow me to share a story, just one, my story, my version of the story at least, about Hawaii and the knowledge, including science, that protected one of the most spectacular ocean places on the planet, Papahanao Mokuakea. Hey, I'm having real issues. So before I talk to you about Papahanao Mokuakea, context is important, yeah? Context matters. Knowledge, especially traditional knowledge, is really localized. And you have to understand Papahanao Mokuakea in context of the entire archipelago. Hawaii is the most remote archipelago on Earth and, and can boast more ecological diversity in one kind of chain of islands than perhaps any place on Earth. I think if Darwin came here, he might have sped along that early thoughts, actually, even if we didn't have marine iguanas. Many, many species evolved here like none other on the planet, co-adapted, balanced, and formed an amazing array of ecosystems in a very small landmass. And the same goes for the ocean, right? We know that and we're discovering that more and more with each and every dive. Our origin story tells us that we descend from nature and actually more specifically the ocean, as I mentioned earlier, and really the understanding that the coral polyp, the polyp, not the reef, the polyp, was our eldest non-human ancestor to emerge out of the, the primordial kind of darkness or pool. And because of this kinship, we're taught from a pretty young age to, to respect the ocean. It's pretty common still here now. And bringing really intimate understandings of the natural world from the rest of islands to the south, our human ancestors were wayfinders, Polynesians who traveled the world's largest oceans thousands of miles across thousands of years on the world's, you know, in double-hulled sailing canoes like this one to bring the ancient art of what we now, I would say, is the interdisciplinary understanding of physics, astronomy, biology, oceanography, engineering, atmospheric chemistry, climatology, the list goes on and on, to find their way, only using the sun, star, moon, and nature. Now, you can quibble whether or not those categories uh, or what they did was quote unquote science as we define it today, but no doubt they had deep and accurate knowledge of the natural world in, in, in order to make that feat. Knowledge that would also be used to develop land and coastal tenure systems to grow food and create flourishing, self-sustaining social systems described in anthropology as one of the most sophisticated of all civilizations. But context, I mean contact, excuse me, colonization and Western approaches changed our relationship to the land and sea, muting our ability of this ancient system and knowledge to function sustainably and changing the relationship we had as people to nature, from being part of nature to being separate from it. I tell you this not to be, oh, how sad we are in Hawaii, and this is for those of you who are visiting from around, but because this is a story that's been told in so many places. Name the place, especially if you're looking in coastal areas, especially if you're working on coral reefs, especially if you're in places where there are long time cultures and peoples and societies and local communities that have been living and sustaining themselves by the sea. If you're one of those people, and I think most people in this room probably are, you really need to understand that context in order to be effective in what you do because context matters. History matters. The, the, the people and communities living in those places are coming from a point of view and a set of knowledge that didn't start today didn't start with the science or the question or the hypothesis on the table. It started with all this underlying 
stuff. You know, and the science at, that, at this time of change really was a science of exploitation, right? Understanding the natural world and using it to basically de derive more and more because we didn't understand what it was doing ultimately. And this kind of exploitation even happened in the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands. It wasn't just here in the main Hawaiian Islands, including kind of collection of, of seabird eggs you see in the bottom center photo. This most remote and uninhabited part of the chain even then wasn't far enough away. So fast forward. As stories of overexploitation of the area grew, early protections, the early, earliest protections of this place were put into place to protect seabirds back in 1909. Lots of science then took place over the next seven, 70 years, ranging from the early Tanager expeditions that you'll see there that unfortunately witnessed extinctions and also documented um, the impact of use to fisheries studies in the 70s and 80s to underpin what were the kind of early fisheries management Monk seal and sea turtle work led to efforts to protect threatened and endangered species, and long-term data sets documented the largest seabird rookery in the North Pacific. Awesome. At the time, conservation and science was about single species or function, not necessarily looking at whole systems. It wasn't until 2000 that the first comprehensive coral reef assessment was undertaken. And it was really, I say, a lesson in uh, use what you got, in my opinion, because after the 1998 global coral, coral bleaching event, momentum was really building globally and nationally to protect where U.S. had coral reefs. Well, where were these in this place called the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands? Well, where are those? Well, in the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands. Okay, let's go check them out and see what's happening. And that's where this idea came, was to find out what, what this was all about. And there was... This, this was the, the result, and I put this up there because it was like a skinny little packet, right? It was a skinny packet. There was like mountains of all this species data, mountains of fisheries data, and like this little packet written by Dave Golko and, and Alan Friedlander and others saying like, this place is awesome, and we went there once, and we're going to publish this thing, and we want you to be able to create protections based on that, right? That's bold. You think about it now, it's like kind of funny actually to think, and it really here, it was not only about the science, it was about the people, right? The science, if you would have argued, like really didn't probably have enough underpinning from a scientific standpoint, but the brave, the courage of these scientists to say, nope, we're gonna use that and we're gonna, we're gonna communicate this and we're gonna put it out there and we're gonna use this because it's what we have to basically ask the non-fishery dependent questions or the non-single species questions and say, what does it mean in its totality? I'd say that, that that first kind of foray into this really changed the trajectory of this place. And it changed, like, you know, my career. It made me want, and I thank people like Alan and Beth Flint, who really turned me on to science and who's like, you can help us translate what we're doing into helping make it matter. And had it not been for that invitation by D Dave Golko and that understanding by people back then, by these scientists back then, that this stuff should matter, that taking a berth or a couple of births on a scientific mission was gonna be worth doing this, maybe none of this would have happened. So that pamphlet that I laugh about today provided enough confidence to back the establishment of the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands Coral Reef Ecosystem Reserve back in 2000 by President Clinton and initiated a five-year public process to consider the establishment a national, of a national marine sanctuary. It was at that time that there was very little understood about the culture, yet the Hawaiian community was a very big part. A handful of Hawaiians played a very pivotal role in kind of creating what I considered an uneasy alliance with environmentalists and scientists at the time, but had known about this place, but most of what was written down in Western science was through anthropology and archaeology, kind of documenting sites and coming up with theories of where this all came from and who were these mysterious people and all of that, but it really didn't sit well with the Hawaiian community because it, what didn't, it didn't match the stories that we knew from our Ni'ihoan cousins and from others who had a different understanding of what these sites might mean. And that led to other kinds of research and to a young researcher named Keiko Evakiki Loy who built his scholarship and his academic career on trying to identify this. And who did we take up? 
we didn't take up more archaeologists, we took up navigators, those who were training in our modern um, kind of resurrection of this ancient art to ask them, what did they think? And that was the beginning of them saying, wow, this, this follows the sun. These are navigational points. These, this is a compass. This island operates as a compass. And later, we took our Marquesan uh, friends and cousins up there because the Western science had said, oh, these are Marquesan in origin. And long story made short, they went up there and said, mm, not, not ours. That's all you guys. So we had more work to do to figure that out and inspired a whole new body of information. It also made our kupuna more comfortable. The trust that was building through this process made our kupuna more comfortable to share insights they had had that, you know, that basically Mokumana Mana, labeled here Necker, sits on the Tropic of, can uh, of Cancer. And really, from a cultural perspective, is the northern extent of the sun, right? That's, that's it. So that's the end of the universe for the living. As you can see, and, and where the source in pole and where we return, we all have stories. All of our islands have these lena, these leaping off points that go northwest. Well, what's the northwest? What was so cool and helped us fill with pride was, man, so many cultures have that mythical place that we came from. That place that, oh, way back over there, and like, it's a physical place on a map. That's pretty cool, right? And it follows nature. Also, Papahana Mokuakea helped us to remember and resurrect the many body forms of one of our four major gods, Kanaloa. These are all these various ways that Kanaloa expresses itself, and to look at an ocean area the way our ancestors did, not chopped up by international boundaries, but looking as pathways, as the ways that our, one of our major gods expresses themselves, is also a really powerful way for us to remember who we are in a place that's still fully functioning and healthy. So it's all of this stuff compiled together that five years later led to the establishment of the Marine National Monument and it was set aside purposely to protect both nature and culture, right? not only for its special ecology. And it, when it was later named by one of our elders through a process with a cultural working group, it was given the name Papahanao Mokuakea to talk about these deities, Papa and Wakea, who birthed, Hanao to birth the islands. And the idea wasn't just this story of what happened before, oh yeah, these guys birthed these islands, but this notion of regeneration. The notion that it, we are, it's all cyclical, and this idea to bring back and the importance of having these places that are still vibrant and still demonstrating what the world looked like underwater before our baseline of wellness shifted. So thanks to, a, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna get to the science part now and this idea of, of bringing these things together is that in this, we've had many science partnerships and I'm gonna talk about one in particular. Thanks to a federal earmark, we had a five-year partnership with the Hawaii Institute for Marine Biology out here on Moku Oloe in Kaneohe Bay. It began a little bit controversial, right? As when you drop a pile of money in the middle of a room, it creates a lot of competition. <laughs> it created also a lot of feeling like, hey, what happened to all of our, si where's your science partners from before there was money? Do we get part of this? Are we part of this thing? Will this science take off? Right, and then of course you had the usual, like our first few meetings, managers on one side, science on the other, silence. All these assumptions built up over all oh, those scientists who don't want to do management-driven science, all oh, those managers who have no idea and aren't using our science to do things better, like all that stuff, right? These, these assumptions we have, these barriers. We had those tables, we're sitting across from each other, and we had to work through that. We had to work through that a lot, and I'm proud to say it, I'm gonna start with the conclusion, like any good news release, that I wanna tell you, these are, there's more success measures, but this was captured in time, and the five-year mark, that there were, what, what happened as a result of this five-year partnership? By any kind of academic outcome me measure, but more than 160 peer-reviewed publications as a result, including a special edition um, of a journal. We had a leverage of a four-to-one match. So for every federal dollar that was put in about, HMB was able to hustle about four more, right? That's pretty awesome. 61 postdocs, graduate, and undergraduate students were funded through that. That's pretty impressive, building the next generation of science, thousands of news articles, and the impact of this information has gone to for state and federal policy and through some draft 
um, bills. The, the knowledge that came from that helped to underpin that. But it wasn't easy, right? Again, I said it, we kind of took, it took a while to build, to break down those barriers. It took a while for trust to develop. And a lot of people said, yeah, well, you guys had a pile of money. Well, I'm going to argue that resources was only part of, the, of what made this successful. In fact, part of what we did was analyze it. We wanted to tell and see, well, what worked? Why did this work? Let's do an analysis. And we surveyed people, and we asked. And, and what came out is what did it make it, what, what made it work? And I'm going to name five ingredients here. Four came from that study, and one is just kind of my own reflection back. The first is it was about people. It was about science. It was about good science, but it was about people, right? Science doesn't make action. People do. It's the choice of scientists to engage in this, to sit with us, to argue with us, to not to be confused by us, and vice versa, right, to do that. So it really wasn't just people and the number of people. It was like leaders, people like Joanne Leong, people like Rob Tonin, people like Brian Bowen, who really helped to move that forward with their colleagues. And often, I remember seeing them like, you know, they're really not that bad. No, let's, like, let's communicate this. And they were kind of leveraging their peers and colleagues. But sometimes we'd sit in and we'd have these tense kind of presentations. And I remember this one moment where I'm like, that's awesome, but seriously, so what? And I thought I was going to get thrown out of the room. But I think that's a really important question. We have all this science, but, but so what? So what if we have the science, if we can't figure out a way to translate that science and make it actionable? And that's where communication came in. Communication internally, and actually I would be lying if I said it wasn't forced. We'd get in there and be like, okay, the person who was hired to coordinate was like, okay, it's another time for a quarterly meeting, and we'd all go, oh, okay, really, do we, can we be busy? Because it was hard sometimes. But honestly, had we not been forced, and then at, over time we looked forward to it, to get into the room, to talk about data, to ask those questions, to figure out how to strengthen the connection to management, it wouldn't have worked. It wouldn't have worked over time. You had to have those levers to kind of make sure that there was internal communication and then external so that we could tell other people about it, so that we could test, right? Send out a message and if nobody bid or the media didn't care or people had more con questions than they had before, we knew that the next time we had data now to kind of do something different the next time. And I will say a third ingredient was the focus on management. And this was also a tough one, right? Was it management-driven science? Because, man, that can be a dirty word, right? Or was it science that's to, to help drive better management? We went back and forth on all of this perspective, but either way, where we got was that we wanted this to matter. We wanted it to go into the management plan, and that was shared. So that focus on management was a core value, a core goal. And we had others as well, and that's also a really important part of whatever you focus on as partners. And accountability. Okay, accountability to each other. Once you develop this, right, and you had these friendships and you had this funding, we had to be accountable not just to Congress and the public, which we did. We had these quarterly reports. We made sure we did that. But we became accountable to each other. And not just as colleagues, but as people, as friends, to make sure that we followed through on commitments, to make sure that we were able that we, we demonstrated respect in, in how we talked with each other and how we shared it, and accountable to defend each other when the science or the management was being called into question, not because you just wanted to defend it blindly, but because each other, we each had the opposite tools to help make sure that people could see the value that the other was bringing. So I'd say that that was internal and external accountability. And a big one, shared credit, right? We didn't always do this. And we, or sometimes we did it, but we didn't, it didn't get mentioned in the news, or it didn't equally get on the co-publish, uh, the, the, the authorship line got kind of mucked up in there, right? But this was the principle. And we learned because when we did it, so I'd say always, because we didn't do it always, but we learned that if you aim for always, you're going to do pretty good. And then you assume good intention instead of the opposite. And we had a few hiccups over time. But in the end, I mean, I love that one of the last papers that we co-published with uh, Rob Tonin, like we were arguing over not who would be first author, but who would not be first author because we were trying to give it to each other. That was a sign of, I think, true collegial respect and working together. And in all, what I think those all equaled was trust. 
and the shared commitment that went beyond the money. So, in fact, I just checked in with Randy to make sure that this was accurate because I haven't been around Papahanaumokuakea for two years, but I'm like, this is still continuing, right, Randy? There's no money, but it's like, absolutely. These relationships, the institutional as well as personal, is still moving this forward. But what were the tangible outcomes? So I just talked about these lofty like five principles and how we kind of went through this big you know, friendship process and it was all great in the end, but what did it do? Did it make a difference? Right, that question from the very beginning. What did? I mean, one thing that when Rob and I did the Robin Alani show with Congress and shared some of this, we were proud to say that the, collectively it provided evidence. There are three core kind of hypotheses that went into when the monument was created. One was that the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands was a source for the main Hawaiian Islands, and it actually turned out that it's three to 30 times more in the opposite direction, hence the big fat lines. It provided the information to know that our hypothesis wasn't totally correct. We also had a hypothesis that it was an extraordinary special place worth becoming a marine national monument, et cetera. And it indeed proved from endemism to predator, apex predators, on and on, that this was a unique place indeed. And a third hypothesis was its remoteness would protect it from threats. But Kim Selko and other folks who helped us with the human threat assessment proved the opposite that we basically got rid of every anthropogenic local stressor and the bigger threats were still coming. So even being the most remote archipelago on earth did not make us immune and we needed to pay attention to that. And genetics, awesome genetics work, really confirmed the boundaries. People said, man, those are too big, you don't need them that big, blah, blah, blah. But it looked at these genetic breaks Right? And it did find that actually our boundaries were defensible. And in fact, from a kind of uh, seeding point of view, that we have huge ecological links to Johnston Atoll, which also called on our monument to work quickly with the, closely with the Pacific Remote, Pacific, gosh, Remote Islands Marine National Monument. Gosh, these are names that need to be shortened. Um, and to make sure that we connect our science together in both management. And the sum of this research, and kind of all of the rest, not just HIMB research, but the research we've done over time, you know, we would compile it in our data management system, et cetera, and kind of plot out in summary, you know, what did it mean? What did we do where, right? And, this, and what that, provided was really the scientific underpinning for, you guys may have heard, a current proposal by the White House to potentially expand this already large California size almost monument to include seamounts, more deep ocean, and many, many maritime heritage sites from World War II. And it's going to be discussed here on Friday, by the way, for anybody who's interested. So I'd say that in some, what I was so proud about was 15 years of research, dedicated research. Research matters. And it's able to not just be yet another pie in the sky idea, but be able to say, no, look at what we found over those years. Here is what we're able to, to move forward, to move these ideas in the public forward, to change how our public, how our communities think about ocean as us, as heritage. It also provided the scientific underpinning for this massive application we wrote to the International Maritime Organization to create a particularly sensitive sea area there. This is one of the things we don't often talk about, but there's only 13 in the world and we are one of them. It's pretty hard to prove up for the to, for like shippers and the maritime entities from around the world to avoid areas, especially huge areas. It's a massive undertaking and that science helped us do that. It also underpinned, along with the research that we were doing and the cultural understandings and knowledge about the cultural heritage of this place, it helped us with the dossier, which is like a PhD uh, thesis, by the way, to uh, get Popohanaumokuakea inscribed as the world's first mixed natural and cultural marine world heritage site. And how funny that while the Phoenix Islands is just a little bit bigger in terms of being the biggest marine world heritage site. We are the biggest cultural world heritage site in the world. And I think that's pretty cool. A site that honors 
basically the the, the long the, the, the history the open ocean history and connectivity of peoples throughout the Pacific of deep sea voyaging and of the affinity of a living culture still tied to the sea as the largest cultural site in the world like way bigger than any cathedral on the list although those are really awesome too changed how the world and how UNESCO the UN thinks about oceans as heritage. Part of HIMB work along with the work of lots of others, including UH Hilo and Manoa, other, the main campus, created an Opihi project that I'm hoping people are presenting here. I just think this is the coolest thing, bringing the intimate knowledge of fishermen who have been doing this in their families for generation and generation. And for those of you who don't know what Opihi is, it's those limpets there. And I know you guys are like, what? You guys eat those things? They're a tremendous delicacy, like really. And when you're in a nutrient poor part of the world and you don't have a whole lot of other things to eat, this becomes a main part of your diet. And we started to see massive shifts in these populations and decline. So through this partnership, which again was a little bit of this mistrust, how do you get fishermen and scientists and geneticists in particular who are speaking a completely different language to work together to understand and to see what assumptions, what kinds of methods are used by the Hawaiian fishermen versus the biologist to understand really what healthy population should look like. And this project is being replicated across the main Hawaiian islands and also some of the work has been used in our state legislature. It's also, we've also worked hard to make sure that traditional ways of knowing are involved. So I, I'm using these words, I'm kind of wanting to make sure that I'm expressing them correctly, that it's like scientific techniques, but they're ways of knowing, and this kind of fuzzy thing in the front is a hand. And so this is the research that went up to Mokumana Mana to take a deeper look into what are all of those historic sites and what do they do for us, and they basically look at these markers and mark where the sun moves and the moon travels at different times of the year and in the morning and in dusk and at noon. Same spot to be able to track and, and look at the placement of these sites and what might be their significance. And what we're really trying to understand is at a deeper level, what were Kupuna doing there and for what reason and how does that help us think about ourselves today? Right? It's not just this ancient cool stuff that happened, but how does that place us on the planet today? And also underpin that to get there, that this place, this area where we cross over into the realm of, of Po or of our ancestors, that it really is kind of a, provides a, it was probably like the best field practicum or whatever experience for folks who were the kind of, the, the depth of the knowledge holders or kahuna back then. I'm proud about our next generation training that we've really methodically invested in. This is our UH Hilo students, our Ku'ula students, Hi Miss Saki, who came to us, I don't know, a couple years ago, it was like, we have this crazy idea, we want to take students up there and like use um, what they know and traditional techniques. They're using their hand to look at solar movement and measurements using your body parts, traditional units of measure, to look at these in one and then donning their dive gear and using the best of what they know from Western science to get in there and compare. And most people thought she was kind of crazy. And she wasn't, she was spot on to help bridge and break through in this and help to not validate Hawaiian knowledge and understanding, but bring the best of these knowledge gathering and systems together, right? They bring different things to the table and they're all knowledge. So all this work, so when we created Pabohana Mokuakea, if somebody said you're gonna create a global movement for large scale MPAs on the planet, I think we wouldn't have done it, right? Cause it's kind of like a crazy idea, this crazy idea that started this global trend. Well, this, this principle, these relationships that we had with HIMB led us to try to develop and work with, a, with an entity, a, a network of the world's largest marine protected areas called Big Ocean that we founded to, to work together to forge a research agenda. And it was really that community of practice we had with HIMB put together and taken to the six sites that established in the world to say, hey, let's figure that out. Let's look at the role of these large scale MPAs. Here, for example, the difference in the trajectory of where we were predicting would large scale, and the role large scale MPAs would play in protecting the global goal of 10% of the ocean and papers that we co-authored, this idea of taking this hard-earned relationship 
we create it here on those principles to the globe. And why does that matter? Well, there's 19 of these on the planet today, either by government proposed or established or declared and established. 11 countries, 10.5 million square kilometers. That's a lot. That's 3% of the ocean in these 19 sites. And people said, those things are far away. There, there's no culture out there. Guess what? The culture of the ocean is big and strong, and the potential for these large-scale sites to change how humans on the planet think about the broader ocean, even the areas beyond national jurisdiction as heritage, like our canoe that's going around the world, traversing the entire global oceans, changing how we see ourselves as humans on the planet, that we are all oceanic people. And this community of practice is kind of the hot new term that people are using, but really we were using it, we were a community, we we're practicing this stuff that we then took to the large scale MPA community. And now we're taking it further and just in February held a think tank for human dimensions to get our biophysical and social science friends together to really talk about that because really biophysical science alone, again, isn't enough. You need all that human stuff. What are the benefits that the ocean provides for people and how do we connect to that? Because there's motivations in here. We need to understand how people see themselves and how they want the ocean to function and how they see themselves in. And this is my one of two commercials for CI because human benefits is part of my new transition to Conservation International talking about an ocean health index that was developed. But really the core of that is that anytime you have a use, you change a benefit for good and for bad, right? Of, of what that provides and we have to be deliberate about those choices and the decision making and science and knowledge goes into helping us understand that and there's so much more work to be done. So in my new role I'm excited that we kind of get to keep working in coral reef areas, right? There's, here's a map of coral reef in the orange coral habitat around the world and in blue are kind of the spaces that CI is looking to invest in. Look at how much work there is, how many places we're not, but if we put World Wildlife Fund, I mean uh, Foundation and all the other NGOs, big and small, we put governments and intentions and communities on this map, if we build a bigger community of practice using these principles, science can matter. Science should matter. And science in partnership with local and indigenous knowledge, I believe from our work in Papahanaumokuakea and now our work in extending those principles to those other 18 sites in the world, I believe is proving that that is exactly the lever. It's science plus all of these things that can help us drive management, help us drive action, and ultimately, again, return people to the sea from whence we came because this is about the future, like Paul talked about. He isn't about the past. It's like, let's look, at the old, let's look at the past, but for the future, because we're leaving it to these guys, right? So, e ulu i kapai aina o Hawaii, flourish, e ui, a mandate for Hawaii to flourish, e ulu i kahonua, for the earth to flourish. That's really the, the goal of it all. Thank you so much for your time, for listening to this story, and I hope in some small way it is shared with you the, the practical ways that we have found that science can matter. And I'm just really optimistic in seeing everybody here from around the world who want to see their science matter, that together in some remote corner of the coral reef world, we can continue to build this community of practice for the future and for future generations. Mahalo.